These are obviously very upsetting and hard times. We'll take the chance here not to so much talk about the earthquake, but more about how we came to where we are today. It's kind of fascinating, actually, because it's important to uh, remember under which circumstances the AKP government came into power. The party was founded uh, in 2001, and they came to power one year after the foundation of the party in 2002. And it's very important to understand the backdrop uh, of this uh, for everybody, I think, because they came at the aftershock of two maybe very important events. One was the 1999 uh, earthquake that was a major earthquake that caused up to 18,000 deaths officially most probably more. And of course, on the backdrop of a major economic uh, crisis that Turkey went through in 2001. Uh, already, the Turkish government was in crisis as a backdrop to the Asian market crash. And that was made, so there was already negotiations, loans from the IMF. Uh, and then came the 2001 crisis, which crashed the economy and uh, got rid of the government at the, at the time and uh, bought in the elections then in, that bought in Erdogan. So there was austerity, deflation, very hard times for everybody, big crisis, reeling from the earthquake, reeling from economic pressures. And then now if this tune is kind of sounding similar, it's because uh, ironically, this is also exactly how it is today. The, the Turkish economy has been suffering and people have been suffering from high inflation for, uh, for quite some time now. And there's been now a major earthquake. So it's interesting how <laughs> things have turned out. Erdogan's governments came on this backdrop as anti-austerian and we will build, build, build with this type of very specific developmentalism because, you know, the AKP is Justice and Development Party. This very um, neoliberal developmentalist ideas with uh, private partnerships. Erdogan, although came as a populist leader, he was in uh, no way <laughs> like uh, as left populist as we would understand it. He was basically the revenge of the old Islamic oligarchy against the secular oligarchy of Turkey. Not so long after, you know, AKP became construction and construction became AKP. They grew a massive class around construction industry. So this is what makes also this crisis so remarkable. Also, the government has made very strange claims trying to clean themselves, protect themselves of this very uh, obvious truth that everybody knows is by saying that, oh yeah, like 98% of the buildings were that collapsed were before his time or some strange, like ridiculous number that nobody was like, things for more than two seconds can believe. This is the backdrop. And now I would like to also talk a little bit about what happened after the earthquake. It was extremely delayed responses. People were devastated for two days. There was almost no aid coming to these regions. And like every day people were on social media, on, on news channels uh, saying, where is the state? And the state was almost like, but wait, Oh, us, this kind of uh, public structures and institutions and aid has almost been a forgotten concept because for them, the state was like construction, building, military power, intrusion, and nothing, all this thing of care and maintenance has been long forgotten. Although Erdogan had came into power by criticizing the previous governments on their failure on the 1999 earthquake. And we also saw the typical cronyism and corruption in the in what very little institutions that were left, like the search and rescue uh, institutions, were filled with party members and their relatives, with mostly that are were like lacked any kind of expertise and showed on the ground. Nothing was planned. It was really uh, surprising the scale of the chaos and the confusion almost of the state. So. Since there was no state, it was people and solidarity that was trying to prevail. And this also panicked and scared the governments for some reason, because I guess like polarization has been such an important part of their body politic for such a long time. At the height of the second day, where people were really communicating through 
social media, trying to organize their own aid, their own extraction teams. The government decided to <laughs> close the social media and internet. So, like, it was really incredible to witness what the few reflections of this the state has. Just block social media, do PR, try to, I mean, they already own all the, uh, have all the media, so the emperor has no closed moment. And the other shocking thing was the absence and very delayed response of the army. So normally in big catastrophes, as we most of us seen during floods and fires in our own countries, and even in COVID here in France, for example, uh, field hospitals, army, and you know, because the roads were closed to the things you think the material the army has could have been directed these regions, but the army was not deployed for an unquestionable amount of time. And I remember one of the interviewees in Maraj said that, the first time I heard a helicopter sound was the helicopter that brought Erdogan to the region. A reminder that we are NATO's second largest army. This is insane. We have all the army power and determination to attack Kurdish region, uh, regions in our own territory, in Iraq, and of course in Syria. They needed the army. The army was not deployed. The only solution the whole time is the government officials saying online, uh, on screen saying, oh, don't worry, we construct in one year, we will construct everything back in one year, which terrified people even more because the extremely uh, handful developmentalism and urbanism and urban sprawl that the AKP had directed had caused, uh, had, had played such a big part in this disaster. And the, the state was somehow thinking this would reassure people while it frightened and angered them even more.